We were college sweethearts. We met in, at college. Suzanne was uh, dated my roommate before she dated me. And so I knew a lot about her, and she came in <laughs> like the cafeteria, nice and calm and beautiful, and you know, did wasn't rowdy and rough, and you know, and then she was in the in the Miss Phillips contest, and I go, wow, okay, so just admired him for how he interacted with people, but yet he was he was uh, very comfortable in himself too. So you you need to if you're a young man getting married or you're first married, you need to learn to say. I'm sorry. And you need to learn to say, you're right. <laughs> and then you'll have a happy marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the seasons of life, you know, each season has presented something different before we had children, when we had children, growing up children, college children. Now we have one married and one away. Uh, and, and probably the biggest challenge for me, and Suzanne would not agree, is that I feel like that I'm selfish. You know, and uh, and that's been a that's been a challenge with me all along, and that's a challenge in my life. That, you know, almost daily, not to be selfish. But realizing our, you know, for so many years our identity was Mr. J and Mrs. J, and uh, we realize now that our biggest identity is that. I and Steve, we are a child of God, and that's our right. biggest identity that we want to live out right. to. Right. The best thing I think is the how we complement each other. You know, what I'm, she's very, very, um, she has many, many great qualities. She wouldn't say she did, but she does, and that complements me. You know, makes me look good, and you know, I try to make her look good, and uh, so I think that's that's the best thing about us. But I would say one of the best parts of our our relationship is that uh, we feel like God really did put us together and that covenant relationship is, is strong because we know that uh, God is the center of our marriage, the center of our lives and uh, that we take everything to, to Him to find the answers, that the closer we get to God, the closer we grow to each other and it uh, makes our marriage stronger and keeps us, keeps us connected right. to Welcome to the last part of our series called The Story of Us and the title of today's message is The Foundation of Faith. Now when I was uh, writing this series and putting it together I thought well this may need to be week one you know because before you build something you want to put the foundation first right you don't build it and then add a foundation later to it. Uh, I think it's uh, just God has a way of leading and, and it's just appropriate that we would finish today really talking about the spiritual basis um, for building your life on Jesus Christ. And if you're, if you're single uh, this morning and you may say, well, this isn't going to apply to me, this is very much applies to you because we're talking about building your life. And if you're a married couple this morning, we're talking about building your life together and how that fits together. So uh, it's, been, it's been great to be a, a part of, of this series on marriage and to really see how God has been, been working through that. You know, we've been looking at Old Testament examples of couples over the last uh, four weeks together. Uh, we've been looking at couples like Adam and Eve, the very first um, couple, the very first marriage in the Bible. Then we talked about Jacob and Leah, uh, Abraham and, and Sarah, David and Michal. Um, you know, we found that they all seem to have some struggles, right? They all seem to have some, some poor parts of their marriage, and there's, there's some, some messes there. There seems to be a lot of messes and, and broken marriages in the Bible. You know, sometimes when we read the Old Testament, we're like, man, as soon as someone has like a moment of brilliance, you know, it's followed up by a moment of folly. You, as you read the Bible and you think about it, you know, I think of those pillars of the faith. You know, uh, when you read the Old Testament, you think of like Noah. You know, Noah found grace and favor in the eyes of the Lord, and, and, and God said he's going to flood the world. Noah has to build an ark and get all the animals, two of every kind, into the ark. And, you know, it, it's this great story, and he gets off the ark, and he, he builds an altar to make sacrifice to the Lord, and God sends a rainbow. And, you know, we think they all live happily ever after, right? But if you read on and continue in Noah, it says, Then Noah planted a vineyard and got drunk on, on the fruit from that vineyard that he had planted and, and lay naked before his children, and then he died. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, this is Noah. This is the guy that like built the ark, he was so faithful, and yet he got drunk and naked in front of his kids at the end, and you're like, wait a minute, 
You talk about Abraham and Sarah. We talked about their life last week. We talk about a man who's so faithful, he'll leave his country, his people, his father's household, he'll go into some strange foreign land that God's called him to. And God says, I'm going to have lineage through you. You know, that all the nations on earth are going to be blessed through you. So they knew at some point we're going to have a child, but they, they failed to believe God and, and to trust in his timing. And they're getting old. And so what do they do? Uh, Sarah says, hey, have my servant take her as a wife. Uh, maybe, maybe God forgot, you know, uh, we'll just do the lineage thing through Hagar. We didn't wait upon the Lord. And yet this man of faith, you know, that is such a, a great example. I mean, these, these people are in the faith hall of fame. Well, what about David? King David, you know, a man after God's own heart. Who committed adultery with another man's wife. And then arranged for that man to be killed. An adulterer and a murderer. Yet a man after God's own heart. We look at all of these people of faith in the Bible and we see a mess. You ever think that? You look at all the Old Testament and, and you know you think it's all going to be good and holy and pure and yet it's a mess. There's sin in the camp. There, there's things going on. And it, I remember this really bugged me as a, as a child and coming into my teenage years. I read the Bible more and more. I was like, there's some really messy stuff in here. Why does God put all of these messy stuff with all these messy people in here? And I want to tell you why this morning. If you've ever asked yourself that question. It's because it's all pointing to Jesus. It's all pointing to Jesus. We can never be good enough. We're never going to be perfect enough. Only the Son of God was perfect enough to take on all of our sins and to be a sacrifice of atonement for our sins, to pay for our sins. It's all pointing to Jesus. And that's the whole point of the Old Testament is that we would see our need for Jesus. So what we're going to do this morning is we, as we finish up the series is we're going to jump to Jesus now. We're going to jump to the New Testament. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at an illustration that Jesus told at the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7 this morning. We're going to look at the very end of this sermon. Jesus is finishing it here with this great illustration at, at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount here. And this passage has... Huge implications for our lives. Huge implications. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're single or if you're married this morning. We're going to be looking at it through the lens of marriage. But uh, huge, huge uh, implications for us here this, this morning. So Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 24. And if you didn't bring your Bible, grab the one in the seat there around you and turn it to page 812. Just turn to page 812 real quick and you'll be right where we're at this morning. Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 24. <clears throat> and this is what it says. If you have one of those Bibles with the red letters, this is Jesus. He's speaking. He's, he's just preached, and, and he's, done, he's gone through what we call the Beatitudes. He's talking about forgiveness. And he's talking about worship, and he's covered all these main topics. And he gets to the very end of his sermon, and this is how he chooses to end it. In Matthew 7, 24. Everyone, then, who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine, and does not do them, will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You see, this house that we're reading about here at the, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is using this house as a metaphor for life, that you are, you are building a life. And he's pointing to the foundation of how you're going to build your life. Because everyone is building something. And in the context of looking through the, the lens of marriages this morning, here, here's how we're going to say it this morning. Every couple builds a house. That's where it begins. Every couple builds a house. From the moment you meet that special someone and then they become your spouse, whether you know it or not, whether you want to believe it or not, whether you are aware of it or not, whether you're being intentional about it or not, you are building a house. You are building a life together. Our houses are built 
from the cumulative effect of small decisions. I want you to think about that. Your house, your life, is built on the cumulative effect of small decisions. Some of the decisions you made way back here affects your life today because it's cumulative. The words we speak day in and day out, the decisions that we make, the habits we form, the tones that we use, the perspectives that we have, these small little daily decisions have a way of building homes that we are constructing as husbands and wives for a lifetime. And you understand that a wise builder, or as Jesus would say in our passage this morning, the wise man, the wise builder, understood the long-term benefits of small decisions made right. And so he chose, before he would build his life, to put it on the foundation of the rock. If you've ever had the privilege of building a house, or maybe, maybe just a, an outbuilding, a shed of some type, you realize how important it is to have that foundation right. And as you go through the process, that everything be straight, that everything be level, that your plumb line be made true. Because if you don't have all of those components, then you get somewhere down the road and guess what you've got? You've got a mess on your hands. You have to go back and choose to redo some work that you've done and sometimes it affects everything. The cumulative effect of small decisions affects you for the rest of that project or in the metaphor of life for the rest of your life or in the metaphor of marriage for the rest of your marriage. I remember when Amy and I were uh, redoing our house, we had bought a, our, our house was a foreclosure, and so it needed some work, and, and it was about any part of the house that you wanted to touch needed some type of work, and I remember we put in our kitchen sink, and we decided to uh, take a cheaper route there, you know, as long as you just save money, right? We're going to save money, uh, and so we're going to do this instead of this, and so we chose a, a black drain instead of an antique bronze, okay? Black drain, uh, the paint on it, I mean, almost three, four months after living in the house, begin to chip. And so now we have this black drain that's chipping, chipping and the silver is showing underneath it, and it's gotten really, really, really bad. And so uh, over the weekend, uh, just one of my, my projects in between uh, our, our weekend schedule was to try to get this drain replaced, which I'd never done before. So and it was really easy, guys. I mean, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So, you know, but, but I bought this drain, and I remember that we saved $9 when we bought it less than two years ago. $9, what we saved. And I wish we just bought the $9 more expensive and had put that in from the very beginning because it didn't last. The cumulative effect of, us, of a decision, a small little decision about a drain back there affected us financially and with time and with energy this weekend. And sometimes that's how we, we operate in our marriages. We think, well, I'm going to take, I'm going to cut a corner here and we get down the road and then we, we have a lot of regrets about that. But the wise man, he considers all of the decisions that he's making. But there are always some who think, well, I can just cut some corners here. You see, the foolish builder, he will neglect some of the areas of his marriage, thinking, well, I'll get to that later. We'll, 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 we'll be able to tweak that a little bit more down the road. Foolish builder will often find a more foolish builder's house and like to compare. Well, you know, that makes me feel good. I mean, my house isn't that bad after all because I can compare it over here. Look at, look at the mess that they're in. But then one day, turns into the next, which turns into the next, which turns into the next, and months go by, and then years go by. And you wake up one day, and you think to yourself, I had really good intention of, of fixing this someday. I mean, I meant to do some work on this. But it just never happened. And there's this cumulative effect, not only of small decisions, but there's this cumulative effect of daily neglect in our relationships. There's two ways to total a car. If you think about it, it's pretty obvious. Two ways to total a car. First way to total a car is you get in a bad accident, right? You hit a wall, you hit a tree, you hit another vehicle, bam. The car's totaled, you call the insurance company, they come out and look, they say your car's totaled, here's some money, replace the car, and you go on. But then, there's the other way that you can total a car. And that's called, don't do any maintenance to it. Don't change the oil for 30,000 miles. Just, just, just let it go. And then it breaks down and it becomes totaled. I mean, it's not drivable. It maybe doesn't have the body damage to it, but it was the cumulative effect of daily neglect. And you call the insurance company and said, hey, we can't do anything about this. Why not? Well, because 
you made decisions not to maintain the, the vehicle. If there's a sudden accident, we can cover that. But when it's, the, when it's the effect of these decisions that you made over a period of time, well, your car may be totaled. It was for a totally different reason. Marriages are built on a series of small decisions. And every couple builds a house. And whether you want to admit it or not this morning, you're building a house. Some of you feel like, well, I have built, past tense, I have built the house. But if you're still together, I think you're still building. Maybe in addition, here or there. Well, the first thing I want us to grasp this morning is that every couple builds a house. The second thing is that every house will face a storm. I mean, that's what happened in our text you got a wise builder, he builds a house. You got a foolish builder, he builds a house as well. Foundation's different, but they both build a house. And then the storm comes. Everyone builds a house, and everyone will face a storm. It's interesting to see the similarity in the storms here. If you read verse 25 and verse 27 in our, in our text this morning, you find out that those verses are identical. They both describe a storm coming, and they're exactly the same. It says that when the, that the rain fell, and that the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house. You know, I think the trouble is that many times uh, we don't think we're going to experience that in our marriages. We're kind of naive that we're going to go through a time of struggle. Maybe it's financially. Maybe it's a time of struggle with raising kids. We got, we've got a, a wayward son or a wayward daughter that doesn't go the right way. And we, we struggle and there's tension because I hate my job now. I thought I loved this work and I don't like this line of work anymore. In fact, I, I dislike it so much it's affecting our daily life. And we're under the stress and pressure to achieve this and to keep up with the next door neighbors and the people down the street. And we've got to get a bigger house and we've got to do this. And, we, you know, and, and, and it just, the storms come. And I didn't even mention that you have a health problem. I didn't mention that there's a sudden accident. I didn't mention that the stock market crashes, that the ener energy sector falls. Storms are going to come. Storms will come, and we're all going to experience the storm in our life. But here's what we find out in our text this morning. When the storm comes we're going to find out exactly what our house is made of. And we're going to find out exactly what it was built upon. Find out exactly what foundation this life and this house was built upon. So every couple builds a house, and every house will face a storm. And the third thing that we need to learn this morning is that only the house built on the rock will stand. Only the house built upon the rock, and that's with a capital R, rock, because the rock of Christ Jesus, the rock of the Son of God, only that house will stand. Jesus says that someone who hears and does not do what he says is what? He's a fool. I think it's interesting that Jesus calls him a fool. Jesus didn't say, the person who hears my words and doesn't do what I say, he is evil. Jesus didn't call him evil. Jesus didn't say that person is wicked. That person is malicious. That, that, that person is malign. That person is bad news. No, Jesus doesn't say anything about, about that. He says, the person who hears my words and doesn't do them is a fool. Probably a bunch of us that can relate to that this morning. We hear the word of God and we do not put it into practice. We do not do what it says. And Jesus doesn't say that you're evil. He doesn't say that you're a bad person. He just says you're foolish. You're foolish because you're building your life on the foundation of sand. You know, what foundation have you built your house upon to this time? Some of us have, have built it upon feelings. And we, we talked about this in weeks one and week two, so I don't want to belabor this point, but feelings come and go. They're hot and they're cold. There's seasons of, of passion in your, in, your, in your marriage. And then there's seasons where things just seem to be going bad and it, it's, just, it's, a, it's a pathway of darkness and, and, and the feelings have, have waned and they've grown cold. And that's why some of you are frustrated because your spouse is not making you feel the way that you once did. 
That's one of the foundations, one of the sandy foundations we, we build a marriage on. Another one is that getting my needs met. I mean, I mean, Steve and Suzanne talked about it in, in, in their story just, just a few minutes ago about selfishness. It's all about me. There's almost no time when I have the privilege of talking to couples about their marriages that I at some point don't hear somebody say, I'm not getting my needs met. Which says that we, we, have, we have a problem with me. We have a problem. It's not about the story of us. It's now the story of, of me. And me getting my needs met. And me being selfish. And the wise man in our text this morning, he does what? Look, look at it there in verse 24. It says, everyone then who hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. We see the correlation there, don't we? He hears and he does. He hears it, he knows it, he learns it, he puts it into practice. Now what's the difference? Let's contrast this with the foolish man. The foolish man does what? He hears just the same as the wise man, and he does not do. He hears, but he does not put it into practice. And that's why he's called, he, he's hearing and he, he knows Many of us, we, we hear and we know. Uh, the hearing and the knowing part isn't the hard part for us. It's the hearing and actually doing it. You see, both of them heard it. That's why the foolish man is called foolish. He sat in church. He heard the messages. He went to small group and answered questions about it. He even went and talked to a marriage counselor. And he didn't do what he knew God was telling him to do. He hears... And he even knows and comprehends what God wants him to do, but he does not do it. If you're here in Matthew chapter 7, I want you to turn your Bible to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. So if you're in Matthew, just turn toward the back of your Bible, and when you hit Hebrews, the next book there is James. James chapter 1. If you're following along in the Bible that's provided for you, just turn to page 1011. Page 1011, I'll bring you right there to James chapter 1. We're going we're gonna to look at one of my favorite verses in the Bible. You've probably heard me uh, over the last 11 years say it, you know, 100 times. I, 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 this verse I took on uh, in my teenage years. This kind of became one of my verses about, Eric, if, you, if you're going to claim it, you're going to hear it, then start, start doing it. The way I memorized uh, James 1.22 uh, from the NIV says this. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And I remember struggling with that when I first read it. I thought, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. What do you mean? You mean if you listen to the word of God and you read it and you study it, you mean you're deceiving yourself? How are you deceiving yourself? Well, you have to read the rest of the verse. Do not deceive yourselves do what it says because if you don't do what it says you are deceiving yourself let's read it here in the in the esv this morning james 1 this is how it, it, it puts it it says but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves it's almost like he's saying you're, you're kidding yourself here and look what it says in verse 23 for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away and at once he forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, a doer who takes action, then he will be blessed in his knowing is that what it says there? Knowing? No. He will, be, he will be blessed in his hearing. In just hearing. No. What does it say? He will be blessed in his doing. Doing. It makes all the difference. It makes all the difference between being a wise and a foolish builder. And that's the challenge for most of us here this morning. That's going to be the challenge for us, because there's a lot of us here. I mean, some of you are thinking, I've heard this before. I've heard this before. And I would say to you, good, but that's not the point. The point isn't that you hear it again. The point is that you would put it into practice. That's the whole point of Jesus ending his sermon. He said, I've told you about the Beatitudes. I've told you how to forgive. I've told you how to be a light on a hill and a lamp on a stand. I've told you how to relate to each other. I've told you, and I've told you, and I've told you, and you've been hearers. 
And if you're wise, you'll hear, and you'll do it, and you'll be like a wise man because you're building it on the foundation of what my Father has instructed you to do. And it's a rock, and it's solid. And some of you that hear and choose to still do not do and not walk in the Spirit, and not allow God's way in your life, you build it upon the sand, and when the storm comes, you're going to find out what it's really made of. And for some of you, it's going to be very, very scary. It's not enough that you know what you need to do. You have to actually go do it. If you've ever been to Italy, one of the top tourist attractions there is this place called the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, seen that. You've probably seen, you've probably seen something like this before. Uh, when they built that, they actually didn't build it leaning. Uh, did you know that? Yeah, they just built it uh, there in the uh, province and in the area of Pisa. Uh, do you know what Pisa means in Italian? It means marshy land. We built a tower on marshy land. Scientists say that, that structure moves, continues to lean more, a quarter of an inch, about a quarter of an inch. Doesn't sound like much, does it? Every year. It will fall someday. Proven fact. It's still moving, still set on marshy land. It will fall someday. They built it on a foundation of marshy land. Sometimes we build our marriages on foundations. They're not based on God and not based on His principles and not based on our relationship with Him. We've built our relationships on marshy land. <clears throat> you based a marriage on a, on a conditional love, on a needs being met type of marriage. It's a very, very marshy sandy foundation i know our culture and our media would condition us to to think that you know every movie every tv show would tell us that you know conditional love is the where it's at it's all about feelings it's all about selfishness it's all about getting yours some of you you get your feelings at the core of your self-value from your spouse I mean, your identity and your affirmation just as a person, feeling good as a person, is all wrapped up in how your spouse feels about you. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a lot of pressure to put on someone, doesn't it? Some of you are looking to your spouse to do what only Jesus can do in your life. And it's like you're saying to your spouse, I want you to be God for me. I want you to be God for me and make me feel the way I want to feel. I want you to be God for me because I want you to be perfect for me. I want you to validate me. And I want you to meet all my expectations. And you wonder why we feel so many times like we're in this pressure cooker. And that's why a spiritual foundation built upon the rock of Christ Jesus, a relationship with Him, is critical if your marriage is going to make it. In Psalm chapter uh, 127 verse 1 it says unless the Lord builds the house those who build it labor in vain unless the Lord builds the house those who labor they build it in vain why because it's got to be built upon the Lord and I know some of you this morning you're thinking Wow, <laughs> my foundation is, is broken. I've asked uh, Shane and, and, and Shayla McKenzie to come this morning and to uh, sing a song for us as we end this time. And they're going to sing it, and then I'm going to close this. And I just want you to listen to the words of this song. Um, I, I just want you to really feel uh, the heart of it. Um, just listen to it. Let God to speak to your heart uh, through music this morning. This song is uh, something that's really, really special for Shayla and I. It's a uh, kind of story of a lot of people, but a story of our marriage. Um, went through a really, really rocky season. Um, uh, yeah, had, had some, some tough patches, and uh, we decided that uh, we were going to keep God number one, no matter what, that uh, divorce wasn't an option, and that uh, we were going to keep him as our foundation, as our rock, as the cornerstone. And this song talks about how even when we 
when we fail, when we mess up, God, will you still give grace? Will you still be there? Um, and when, uh, when we lie and we, and we mess up, will you still call us child? Will you take things that are broken and can you still make them beautiful? That's the whole premise of the song is that's what God's good at. That's, that's what he does is he takes things that are beyond what we can fix, shattered. Some of our marriages feel like it's shattered. And some of us today, some of you maybe say, it is too late. I've already gone through it. I, I feel bad enough in a marriage series because I'm already divorced or I've already had these things in my life. The truth is God takes broken things and he makes them beautiful and he wants to make you beautiful. So that's what we're going to sing about.
And that's the truth. That's the hope this morning. And God can take something that's broken. And I know some of you are sitting here right now and you're like, man, our marriage, it's broke. It's been broken for a long time. Some of you are realizing as your kids get older, we built a sandy foundation here. And if we don't get it on the rock real soon, the storm's going to get really blowing here. And it's going to crash. And God's saying, brokenness aside, I can make it beautiful. If you'll come to me, if you'll surrender to me, if you'll give yourself to me. The awesome thing about our God and His Son Jesus Christ is they're in the business of taking messy, yucky, broken lives, putting them back together, and making something beautiful. Let's pray.